Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the gospel according to John chapter 12. The gospel according to John chapter 12. Uh, For those of you who are watching, all of the scriptures will be on the screens below. For those of you who are here, if you do not have a Bible with you, all the scriptures will appear on the screens to my left, to my right, and behind me. We're looking at the gospel according to John chapter 12. We're reading out of the New International Version of the Bible together. We don't believe that one version is more holy or less holy than another. The NIV is just simple to read and easy to understand. So the gospel according to John chapter 12, we're going to begin reading at verse number 23. And if you have it, say amen. Mm, All right. If you have it, say amen. Well, hallelujah, Haley and Corey, good to see you. All right, John chapter 12, verse number 23 says this, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. (sighs) Beloved, we are in part two of a series that we have entitled Paid in Full. Paid in Full. Paid in Full, like some of you who may be younger, remember the movie Paid in Full, Paid in full, like some of you who are a little bit older, around my age, you remember Eric B. and Rakim paid in full. We're talking about paid in full. However, in church culture, when we use that term paid in full, we are often talking about and referring to a perspective of what has been paid for us, our salvation, our redemption, and its condition. It's full. It is complete. What Jesus paid for you, you can't add to it, nor do you need to. Because it's totally full. All that it is is yours, and there's nothing more to it than all you already have. It has been paid in full. However, our message series is not about that. Our message series is about the price that was paid for what you've received. Because as much as it is awesome to know that what you have is full and complete, that it has been paid in full, what we also have to understand is that the price that was paid for it, that there is a totality for that price. And actually, the totality of that price is what qualifies what you have to be paid in full and complete. That if it wasn't for the magnitude of what Jesus paid, what you now have would not be complete. We're talking about the payment that Jesus made That's what we're talking about when we say paid in full. And this is something that we've got to wrap our minds around because when we say that Jesus died for our sins, we oversimplify what Jesus did. And if we oversimplify this in our minds, there's really no way that we can equate why he died with the magnitude in which he died. And he didn't just die, he suffered. He suffered. He suffered. And so, we want to have a passion about the reward of his suffering, and so we have to familiarize ourselves with the depth of that suffering. We have to understand what really Happen. And we need to begin that with understanding something about Jesus' nature. The Bible tells us that Jesus, that Jesus is divine, and what that means is that Jesus is a part of what we call, or in theology, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, a triune God, one God, and three persons. We often refer to it as the Trinity. You heard that before. 
All right. Now, I know that the Trinity, the idea can be a very difficult idea to understand. It doesn't necessarily make sense, but I believe that God actually designed us in a way to help us understand it. You too are triune in your being. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And all of those three parts are separate and distinct, yet they all work in tandem to perform the oneness that is you. So in the same way, God is in three persons, though it's one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have to understand that this is essential to the nature of Jesus in regard to the price that he paid. Because if he's not fully human, he's not qualified to pay the price for any of us. But if he's not fully God, he's not qualified to pay the price for all of us. Uh, uh, yeah, some of y'all need to write that down. Some of y'all need to write that down. If he is not fully human, he's not qualified to pay the price for any of us. But if he's not fully God, he's not qualified to pay the price for all of us. Both have to be true in order for us to be saved. In order for his death, his suffering and death to operate as a substitutionary atonement. That means he's taking our place. That the penalty that we deserve, he's taking on himself. If he's not fully human, he can't take that penalty for all of us or any of us. But if he's not fully God, he can't take it for all of us. And so both have to be true in order for our salvation to work out the way that God has intended. Yet being fully human is crucial to us understanding his suffering. What's interesting is that the scriptures um, in two places, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, and in John chapter 1, they refer to Jesus' humanity, but they refer to it as something that he takes on, not something that he has already. Both scriptures talk about how he takes on the humanity, which means he was something else before. But that humanity is crucial, and in that humanity, he experiences everything that we've experienced. Everything that we experience, he's experienced, which includes pain. And not just physical pain, but emotional pain as well. So this is kind of where we are with our text because Jesus is about to reveal how he's experiencing some emotional pain. And it comes at an ironic moment in the history of Jesus' ministry. This is the chapter where he rolls into Bethany. Bethany is the town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. It's the town where many people believed because he raised Lazarus from the dead and there were many witnesses who saw him do it, who even heard him when he said, Lazarus, come out. So as a result of Lazarus being alive after having been dead for many days, if you remember, Jesus took his time getting there. After being dead for many days, people were mourning. People were gathering for his funeral. They watched as Jesus raised him from the dead. And so because of that, there are a lot of people in Bethany who already believe in who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So when he comes into Bethany, he comes in and he eats at his favorite, some of his favorite people's house. He's at Lazarus' house with Mary and Martha. They're all siblings. He eats with them, and then they're all getting ready for Passover dinner which is the next night, and this is where he rolls into the town on a donkey. And in your Bible, most likely, the section where he rides in is entitled the triumphal entry. That is another word for the victorious entry. So Jesus rides into this town on a donkey in keeping with the prophecy, and there are people with palm branches who have watched him raise Lazarus from the dead, who believe that he is the son of the living God, and they're waving these branches, shouting, Hosanna to the highest, and they are worshiping him. Oh, my goodness. This seems like a moment where Jesus should be like, yeah, this, I've done it. This is it. I've arrived what I've been teaching, these people have finally gotten. This is a great moment for me 
This is what he should be thinking if we're looking at it from the human perspective, from our own perspective. He's riding in and people are worshiping him. It looks like this is, the great, this is a great moment. I'm at the height of my ministry. This is my blessed place. But he gets there. And the next thing we see is him begin to talk to his disciples about dying. He starts to talk to his disciples, and he's like, listen, let me tell you something. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's alone. But if it dies, it produces other grains of wheat. And then after he says that, he says to them, Whoever serves me must follow me. And I want you to understand what Jesus kind of slipped into them. One of the things he's trying to get them to recognize clearly is that although everything looks great right now, although it looks like I've reached the high point of my blessing and my place in life, Although it looks like I'm being celebrated and worshipped in this moment and that everything is great, it's not over. That this is not the fulfillment of my purpose. Jesus wants us to know that because, do you know, generally, most of us as Christians believe the blessing to be the high point. Many of us believe our place of blessing, our place of celebration, our place of greatness, that this is where God intended for me to be in the first place. Ha! Ah. And Jesus is trying to help them to understand that often that's not the case. That often that's not the case. Blessing is not the place. Purpose is the place. And Jesus is also trying to hip them to the idea that purpose isn't always looking like blessing. And this is where he begins to talk about his own death. And then he begins to talk about their deaths. I, I, look at what he says. Look at what he says to them. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Jesus, interest, interestingly enough, hits them twice, and I don't know if they realize it. Because he mentions his death, and we all read that, right? Whenever you have read, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and die, it falls alone. But if it dies, it produces much more kernels. And we all clearly recognize that Jesus is talking about himself. But he quickly shifts from himself to them and talks about their death. If you love your life, you're going to lose it. And Matthew, he says, but if you lose it for my sake, you'll find it. But that was number two. Number one was a logical progression in the midst of the metaphor that he used. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's alone. But if it falls to the ground, it produces many kernels of wheat. If you logically or naturally follow the progression, then what happens to the kernels of wheat that came from the one that died? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's where most of our minds are. But what happens after they grow? No, I'm not even asking a rhetorical. I want somebody to say, what happens? They die too. And produce other kernels behind them. Do you see what he did? See, I'm wondering if they were paying attention because he was saying to them, look, this is how I'm going to die, and it must be because if I die this way, I'll be able to reproduce. I'll be able to reproduce you. But in the analogy he used, what is reproduced also then later dies itself so that it can produce more. He threw them into the analogy. Then to support it, he said, see, whoever finds whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life will find it. And then he says, whoever serves me will follow me. Do you notice that he didn't say whoever follows me will serve me? 
Those are different things. He said, whoever serves me will follow me, meaning if you serve me, you'll be like me, which is different than whoever follows me will serve me. See, he's trying to keep them in the context of a reality of the kingdom of God, that there is a suffering and a sacrifice, prices that often need to be paid for a purpose, and that even if you get to a place of blessing, often that's not the purpose. There's more beyond that, and he's trying to share this with them. He's letting them know, look, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to serve me, indeed you will follow me. Your life and your journey will look a lot like mine. And then he says this, he says, look, and wherever I am, my servants will be with me also. And then you know what he does? He tells them where he is. Now my soul is troubled. Some of y'all are not, you're not awake. You're not awake. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am... My servants will also be, then he tells them where he is, now my soul is troubled. This is where I am right now. This is where I am. You are going to follow me. And let me tell you where I am right now. My soul is troubled. The soul is the emotional realm. It's where your emotions live. Jesus was no different. And so what Jesus is saying is my emotions are distressed right now. My emotions are agitated right now. My emotions are restless in this moment. There is a conflict going on emotionally in me. If you serve me, you will be where I am. And right now, my emotions are in torment. And his emotions are in torment for a number of reasons. Because as being fully human, he's dealing with the fact that his people are rejecting him to the point where they are the ones shouting to crucify him. He's dealing with the fact that he knows that his disciples are all going to abandon him once he's arrested. Not one of them will stay. He knows that some of the ones that were closest to him will even deny that they know him like Peter. He knows he's about to leave his spiritual family and his earthly family altogether and be away from them. He knows that he's about to suffer significant pain and the horrific death and torture. He knows all of this in advance. And so his soul is troubled. He is hurting. Now here's what's interesting. Generally, people who have the degree of power and influence that Jesus has don't often share their intimate and personal feelings, especially their feelings of weakness. And think about who it is that's revealing this. This is Jesus the Messiah. His critics could not outwit him or capture him. Demons couldn't deny him. Nature couldn't disobey him. Whenever he touched you, your life was transformed. Whether you were bleeding for 12 years, not walking for 30 years, or been born blind, or even if you die, if he touches you, you are changed. And so the same Lord who has this degree of power is in a place where he's sharing with people who are closest to him the pain and the weakness that he's dealing with in that moment. And normally people who are like that and have that kind of power, and I don't mean Jesus' power, I'm just talking about power and influence altogether, don't share their weaknesses. But Jesus is intentional in what he does. He wants his disciples to know that as great as everything has been, that he's conflicted within himself, concerning the will of his Father. Okay, let me, wow, wow. Yeah, but see, that's the point. Have you ever been conflicted about the will of your Father in regard to your own life? 
Jesus wants you to know, so is he. So has he. Have you ever felt conflicted about the will of your father that you know is for your life because whatever is required makes you uncomfortable or requires some kind of sacrifice of you? And aren't you often feeling bad as a result, particularly when you don't surrender and submit? See, Jesus wants you to know that he's been faced with this same kind of temptation. But that even in the midst of great suffering, for him, the purpose that his father has set out in his will means more than anything, even if it means I have to suffer and die. And he wants his disciples to understand where he is so that they then understand the real sacrifice of what he does. What does he say? He says, what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour. He's he's literally talking like a man who knows that his next few hours, that his next few days are going to bring horrific suffering and pain. And there is nothing that he can do about it. He is at the last of his place. What can I say? I know what's coming is bad, but what am I going to do? Say, God, save me. And he's the Messiah. Can't he say, God, save me? But he wants his disciples to know that although this is what he's feeling, what's more important is why he's here. And so he says, what can I say? Father, save me this hour. No, for this very reason, I am here. (laughs) What do you do if... The purpose that God has for you involves suffering. What do you do? What do you do if you know that what God wants you to do is going to be uncomfortable for you to do or require some degree of sacrifice for you to do? What do you do in that instant? Jesus is faced with the same questions and he he models for us what it is that you do. You surrender to your purpose. The Christianity that we preach today um, is God is going to bless everything you do. That God is going to make your dreams come true that God is going to give you everything you want. We preach this Christianity that God is going to make you great. It's all going to be amazing. and He's going to bless you in some great ways. Yet this is not what we saw in Jesus. What we saw in Jesus is that when it looked like he was in his greatest moment of blessing, The real purpose was yet to come. We learned from him that the real purpose was going to require sacrifice and a great degree of pain and suffering. And that Jesus knew. And not only did he know, beloved, but hear me, this is what this message series is about. Not only did he know, but he was suffering with the knowledge. He was hurting. His soul was troubled. When he went to the garden of Gethsemane, he said, my soul is sorrowful. I'm grieving on the inside at what I have to do. And even though he is troubled in knowing what comes for him, glorifying his father and the purpose meant so much more. Our Christianity doesn't look like that, beloved. It doesn't look like that at all. We preach something different. Our version of the gospel somehow doesn't include sacrifice. Our version of the gospel somehow doesn't include any suffering, though we suffer regularly. We suffer in cycles, and we beg for God to take us out. We do what Jesus said he can't do. Father, save me from this hour. And often our suffering 
becomes almost purposeless. Because we always look at the suffering itself rather than the purpose that that suffering may be preparing us for. I, I want to share this with you. We don't sacrifice. We don't want to give God three to four hours a week in a service or some service for his glory or for his purpose. We don't want to give him just a few hundred words in a day sharing your faith with someone that we have thousands of words a day that we use. We don't want to give him 10 cents off of a dollar for the glory of his kingdom and the advancement of it. We don't want to sacrifice at all for our God's glory, but yet we want him to bless us in every single thing we do. And this is totally contrary to what Jesus taught, but also what he lived. He suffered for his father's glory and for the purpose of his father. And we have got to recognize that often the place of blessing is not the high point. Some of us are willing to suffer if we know we're going to be blessed after. And we see that blessing as the high point, the place where we've made it. But I want you to understand something. Do you know that when we look at the story of Joseph, the story that we encapsulate with this phrase, from the pit, to the palace. And we look at that story and we want to see ourselves in that story from the pit to the palace. We might be in a pit now, but soon we'll be in the palace. And we can't wait to get there. But see, when Joseph got to the palace, he hadn't reached his purpose yet. The place of blessing, that was not the high point. That was not what God was trying to do. In fact, the palace wasn't even the reward of his suffering in the pit and in slavery. In fact, the suffering and the slavery wasn't even preparation for the palace. It was preparation for the purpose. He suffered so that he could have a degree of humility so that when he came into the palace and his brothers showed up, that he would have enough humility in him to say, I forgive you because the purpose was that their lives would be saved. So that if we were really to encapsulate Joseph's or, or, or Joseph's journey in one phrase, it would be from the pit to the palace, from the palace to the purpose. Why do we want to stop at the palace? Why do we want to ignore the glorification of our God? Why do we want to sit and believe that our blessing is his ultimate purpose? Jesus didn't teach us that. When we suffer, we are suffering for the betterment of our character. And when we're suffering for the betterment of our character, we are suffering for the intention of our purpose. God wants to change our character so that he can use us in his purpose. See, church, we've got to get to a place where we can identify with Jesus' suffering in the right way. Because surely he said, if you serve me, you'll follow me. That if you'll serve me, your journey will look a little bit like mine. This is why last week we were looking at the Apostle Paul as he was saying, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, even in the fellowship of his suffering. Do you want to know Christ that way? Do you want to walk in God's purpose for your life, even if it requires times of discomfort sacrifice and suffering? Are you willing to look beyond yourself enough to put God's purpose first? Oh. See, that's the question right there. That's the question that many of us don't really want to answer. See, that's the place we don't want to go. That's the lane we don't want to drive in. See, we'd rather life just be all about us and our glory and all about us and our blessings, all about us and what we can post and share to look like we're living at large on Facebook and Instagram and everything else. We want to be able to look like all is well with me. Look how God has blessed me. But what is God getting out of that? Are there people whose lives are hanging on the cliff of hell because you won't sacrifice? Because you want to be comfortable. I 
Jesus, he suffered emotionally. And as he revealed this to his disciples, he wanted them to know that their lives might look a little like his. And oddly, when he said, whoever serves me will follow me, that whoever includes us. But I want to say this to you. God's purpose has a value. It has a value. God's purpose and his glory has a value. And we know it has a value because Jesus was willing to pay everything for it. And if we can just wrap our minds around that, if we can wrap our minds around that, then maybe we can come to understand the value of God's glory and purpose in our lives and be willing to sacrifice, be willing even at times to suffer, to obtain our Father's glory and to fulfill his purpose for our lives. Bow your heads with me. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want everybody in this room and everybody who's watching online just to, for a moment, take stock. Do an assessment of the condition of your soul. See, Jesus suffered. He didn't just die for our sins. He suffered and died for our sins. And that suffering wasn't just physical. He had to go through emotional pain and torment because there was also a value on your soul. He wanted to pay the price. And so maybe you're someone who is in this room right now or someone who's watching and maybe you've never made a commitment to Jesus. Maybe you've never made him your Lord. Maybe you've never given him your life. But isn't the suffering that he endured for your sins worth you giving your life to him? Considering that God gave you life in the first place, doesn't it make sense to give it back to him? And he does this and he makes this offer available in the most simple of ways as Jesus has died for your sins. That means that the sins that you have committed last year, last month, last week, last night, that all of those sins can be forgiven, nailed to the cross with Jesus, and all you have to do to access that forgiveness is to say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died for my sins. I believe that He is risen from the dead. And the Bible says if you make that confession, that your soul would be saved. And when your soul is saved, Jesus receives the reward of his suffering. And so is there anybody today, this morning, who's saying, Pastor Ron, I want to make that commitment. I do want my soul to be saved and my sins forgiven. I see what Jesus sacrificed. I believe who he is and who he, what he did. I believe and I want to give my life today. You just simply raise your hand right where you are. You don't have to move. I'm not going to call you up. I'm not going to ask you to move or do anything like that. But if you're saying, I want to give my life today, you just simply raise your hand right where you are while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there anyone? I see that hand. I see it. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone else? Is there anybody else? There may be some who are watching online who you've made a decision today along with the person who made the decision in this place this morning. And I want all of us to pray together as we lead those of you who are responding in a prayer of repentance. And so I just want you to repeat after me and say, Heavenly Father, I want all of us to do it. Come on, say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I repent today of all sin and I ask you Jesus to come into my life, set a throne on my heart and be my Lord. Thank you God for your mercy. 
thank you for your grace and thank you for your forgiveness in Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you so much for those who gave their lives to you today. We rejoice, Father, with all of heaven over the souls that came into your kingdom today. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice and the suffering that you endured, that those who came to you today could have their sins forgiven and wiped away, that they would have eternal life. Father, I pray for those who committed their lives to you today. I pray, Lord, that you would just begin to transform their lives in some amazing ways. I pray, Father, that you would begin to change their social circles. You don't need to take away the friends they have, but I pray that you would bring friends who are chasing after you into their social circle. I pray, God, that you would connect them with a church family where they can grow and learn and mature and begin to be used by you in whatever way, God, that you desire to use them. I pray that when they open your word, that your Holy Spirit would begin to speak to them and reveal truth to them like they've never seen it before, and that your word would go down into their heart and be an anchor to their soul, and that, Lord, they would follow Jesus, giving their lives to him as he has given his life for them. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do and what you have done today. And we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.